and Hus. He'd put six points on his church door, and they have addressed various philosophies and doctrines of Rome. But Martin Luther's only dealt with indulgences. So Hus, a hundred years earlier, actually went much further than Martin Luther. He was only talking about indulgences, and he had a problem with indulgences. And so, if you go inside the church, and you look up at the great stained glass windows, that very worst verse is engraved in the center over there. So halten wir nun dafür, dass der Mensch gerecht werde, ohne das Gesetzeswerk, allein durch den Glauben. Through faith alone are you justified before God. This is the central pillar, the cornerstone of Protestant doctrine. Now, here's a Roman Catholic webpage, and they are not very happy with what Martin Luther actually uncovered over there, but uh, they actually quote him quite correctly and then try and uh, take him apart. It says here, Martin Luther stands as the originator of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. For he hoped that in this way he might be able to calm his own conscience, which was in a state of great perturbation. And consequently, he took refuge behind the assertion that the necessity of good works over and above mere faith was altogether a pharisaical supposition. Manifestly, this did not bring him peace and comfort for which he had hoped and at least it brought no conviction to his mind, for many times in a spirit of honesty and sheer good nature, he applauded good works, but recognized them only as necessary concomitants, not as efficient dispositions for justification. This was also the tenor of Calvin's interpretation. So this was Protestantism against Catholicism. Luther was surprised to find himself by his unprecedented doctrine in direct contradiction to the Bible. Therefore, he rejected the epistle of James as one of straw, which is true. We'll deal with that. And into the text of St. Paul to the Romans 3.28, he boldly inserted the word alone. This falsification of the Bible was certainly not done in the spirit of the apostles' teaching, for nowhere does St. Paul teach that faith alone without charity will bring justification, even though we should accept, as also Pauline, the text given in a different context, that supernatural faith alone justifies, but the fruitless works of the Jewish law do not. Okay, so there you have it. This is the Catholic view that Martin Luther was illegally inserting a word. It's interesting that Martin Luther originally said that the epistle here, as mentioned, of James was one of straw. And uh, he had a problem because James said, faith without works is dead. And so, well, let's look at history. What happened? And here's an interesting source. Here I stand. Martin Luther's story. Few people realize, and liberal Luther interpreters do not particularly advertise the fact that in all the editions of Luther's Bibles, translations after 1522, the reformer dropped the paragraph at the end of the general preface to the New Testament, which made value judgments amongst the various biblical books and which included the famous reference to James as an epistle of straw. And uh, this comes from lessons from Luther. And then Luther's biographer, Roland Benton, points out, once Luther remarked that he would give his doctor's beret to anyone who could reconcile James and Paul. Yet he did not venture to reject James from the canon of Scripture, and on the occasion earned his own beret by effecting reconciliation. Faith, he wrote, is a living, restless thing. It cannot be inoperative. We are not saved by works, but if there be no works, there must be something amiss with faith. 
Excellent. Apparently, he walked into the class, took his doctor's beret, put it down on the desk, and confronted his students and said, if you can reconcile those two, James and Paul, you can get my hat. And it lay there. Nobody took it. For weeks. And then one day Martin Luther walked in, stepped up to his beret, took it into his hand, popped it onto his head, and said, I've earned it. Because he realized that James was not really contradicting Paul at all. Paul was saying that you cannot be saved by your works, and James was saying the exact same thing, except that James was giving the other side of the coin and saying that if you have faith, then you will have works. But the works aren't the means to salvation. They're a consequence. And so that was resolved. <coughs> so let's go again to the absolute central pillar of the Reformation. What was it? Martin Luther says of this article, justification by faith alone, nothing can be yielded or surrendered, nor can anything be granted or permitted contrary to the same. If the article of justification is lost, all Christian doctrine is lost at the same time. This doctrine, justification, is the head and the cornerstone, therefore the title of this presentation. It alone begets, nourishes, builds, preserves, defends the Church of God. And without it, the Church of God cannot exist for one hour. When the article of justification has fallen, everything has fallen. So here was a pillar that could not be moved. <coughs> it couldn't be moved. Now, at the Council of Trent, this is the council that took place after the Reformation, after Martin Luther had appeared at Worms and said, here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. If you cannot show me by the scriptures and the scriptures of loan that I have heard, then I cannot and will not retract. And the Council of Trent issued the following anathemas. Anyone who says that sinners are justified by faith alone, so as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order unto the obtaining the grace of justification, let him be anathema. That means to be cursed. Anyone who says that sinners are justified by the sole imputation of the righteousness of Christ, or by the sole remission of sins without the charity which is shed abroad in their hearts by the Holy Ghost, that is, without infused grace, let him be an anathema. So Rome taught that we inherently became good when we received uh, this gift of justification. And uh, I always say to people, you can ask my wife how perfect I became after I received this gift. Martin Luther said, no, no. The gift that you receive is his righteousness. So you do not stand in your righteousness, which is as filthy rags. You stand in the righteousness of Christ. So this was the issue. Martin Luther nailed his thesis against that door, and he confronted the issue of indulgences and indulgences alone, nothing else. At that time, the Pope was reconstructing St. Peter's, and he needed a lot of money, and he made a good deal. He made a deal with the government, a deal with the bankers, and with agents that acted as salesmen, and he sold indulgences. And uh, one of the great salesmen at that time was the monk Johann Tetzel. And this was an indulgence box. And uh, you would tie two of these boxes to a donkey, and then you would go and you would sell indulgences. Extremely legal 
documents. Here's a copy of one of those indulgences, and you can see there are various stamps of approval on it, because everybody got a cut. If it was sold in a particular district, the government got its portion, the banks that handled the money got their portion, and the salesman got his commission, and the rest went to Rome. So it was a good business. But the question is, what is an indulgence? And this is very important that we understand what an indulgence is, because the question we have to ask ourselves is, is that issue dead? Is it something that existed in the days of Martin Luther 500 years ago, and people today are no longer involved in this kind of thinking? Or is it something that is alive and well? And if so, what does it mean? What does it really mean? Let's have a look at the Catholic understanding of justification and the imputation of merit. Now please remember what I said in the beginning. I said, let the minds clash, but keep the fists still. This is an issue of ideology. It's not an issue of persons. I cannot go up to a Roman Catholic or to one of any other religion and bludgeon him because he doesn't have my view or he doesn't understand it as I understand it. But if you explain it, then at least he has the capacity or she to make an informed choice. Now Rome teaches a very strange doctrine, and that is the doctrine of the treasury of merit, good works. So Rome claims that it has a treasure chest, and this treasure chest does not consist of money, it consists of good works. Now let's read it. The treasury of merit consists of the superabundant merits of Christ as well as the merits of the saints. The treasury of merit is one because of the communion of the saints in the body, Christ being the head. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches the following about the treasury of merit. We also call these spiritual goods of the communion of the saints the church's treasury, which is not the sum total of the material goods which have accumulated during the course of the centuries. On the contrary, the treasury of the church is the, of infinite value, which can never be exhausted, which Christ's merits have before God. They were offered so that the whole of mankind could be set free from sin and attain communion with the Father. If you look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church and you read the following article, you will see in Christ, the Redeemer himself, the satisfactions and merits of his redemption exist and find their efficacy. This treasury includes as well the prayers and the good works of the Blessed Virgin Mary. They are truly immense, unfathomable, and even pristine in their value before God. In the treasury, too, are the prayers and good works of all the saints. All those who have followed in the footsteps of Christ the Lord and by His grace have made their lives holy and carried out the mission in the unity of the mystical body. So that's the Catholic Catechism. You need to unpack this. What does this mean? So this treasury has the good works of Christ. This treasury has the good works of Mary, which are pristine, and it has the good works of all the saints. And this treasure belongs to the church. This is what Rome teaches. So let's continue with this Roman Catholic explanation. This is them writing. Merit cannot be transferred, but meritorious acts can make satisfaction for another. By giving to God a gift of greater value than what was taken by the sin. This is how Christ's own actions in his passion and death made satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And you must have a look at the doctrine of the atonement. 
But it is also the way the meritorious acts of the saints can make satisfaction for others' debt of temporal punishment. Saint Thomas, this is Thomas Aquinas, writes, All the saints intended that whatever they did or suffered for God's sake should be profitable not only to themselves, but to the whole church.